Okay, uh, we're, we're looking at Ezra, and in fact we're going to finish up Ezra, and uh, Ezra, Ezra is kind of, kind of interesting, because as we move into Ezra, and the same thing will be in Nehemiah, we, we have a, really a tonal shift. Uh, we're looking at the same narrative, and we started the narrative, where did we start the, the narrative? Do you remember where we started this Old Testament narrative? Genesis. Genesis. You know, uh, Genesis. That's where we began. And uh, as we went through the books of the kings, what was sort of the tone of the, the books of the kings? Murders. What's that? <laughs> murders. Okay, murderers. You know, Good. What else did we see in the books of the kings? Worshipping idols. Worshipping idols. What else did we see in the book of the kings? What, if, if those two things are true, and I, they are, what's then the tone? What's the tone? What tone do we get as we go through the... Okay, we get, we get evil. The writer is conveying to his people, the reader, that this was an evil time. You know, and that the and we've talked about it before. What appeared to be the case as the, the writer is presenting this, the acts and I say the writer it could be a lot of writers, but it's easier to just say the writer. Um, it what the king does reflects what the nation does. So if the king is guilty, the nation, the nation is guilty. If the king worships other gods. The nation worships other gods. If the king is good, on the other hand, the nation, the nation is good. Yeah. Now, we know from the... And that's the way the writer of the kings presents it. Uh, we know that's not accurate because we've got prophets that are working at the same time. You know, we've got you know, prophets like Amos that's, that's working in Israel and Micah that's in Judah, but early on when Israel's still a state. We got Isaiah who's there when when Israel when um, Judah's being besieged and Israel falls. We got Jeremiah who's there when when Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians. And and we know, particularly looking at prophets like Micah and, and Amos, that society is not good. You know, it's not just the kings worshiping other gods. You know, people aren't treating one another really well. You know, the and you'll find this hard to believe because we've kind of moved past this. Uh, the rich people showed off their wealth, you know, which we certainly don't do anymore. Oh, no. You know, rich people don't do that anymore. And people were taking advantage of one another. You know, they were using one of the great examples in both Amos and Micah is they're using crooked scales. Uh, you know, so they're weighing out things, but they're crooked. Uh, and that's one of the big. That's one of the big things that the prophets talk about. So we know, even though. As presented in the books of the kings, what the king does is reflective of the people. There's a lot of other stuff going on in these societies. So this is a presentation of history from a perspective. But we get a mood as we look at the books of the kings that we're talking about an evil, you know, people that have good days but have a lot of bad days, and or have a tendency to worship other gods and to drift away from the covenant they have with their god. Okay, so we, we've got that in the books of Ezekiel. How does the, the tone shift as we get to Ezekiel for, uh, or Ezra? Um, and by the way, historically what has happened as we move from the books of the kings to Ezra? What has occurred? Um, they set up, built a temple and a, and okay. a, and a sacrificing table. Why was that necessary? What, what happened? Where were we at the end of kings? They were going to build the temple. Well, at the end of Kings. Oh, at the end of Kings. Okay, they were, they were all scattered. They were taken into Babylon. Jerusalem falls, the nation falls, Judah no longer exists. And they're taken by the Babylonians and they're scattered. They call that the exile. Okay, so they're in exile. Okay, kind of interesting when we look at the uh, uh, one of the passages, I think it's even one verse, in, in Ezra that we're looking at today. <clears throat> They compare the time in exile, and it corresponds with the time that they're kingdom. You know, 14 generations, 14 generations. It's not 
That's not yeah. accurate, you know, because we can count the years historically. But they see that as just as long, being in exile as long as their, their independence. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Don't you think, I don't know, I was just thinking that, uh, you know, when they, when they move the people, uh, like one king wants to worship this way, and the people themselves are used to worshiping, say, the Christian way or whatever. Yeah. Okay, and so he says they got to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so say it's so many years, how do you, how do you really, uh, can you be faithful to, to, to that newer religion when you're, when you were raised with your older religion? You know what I mean? Because right. Everything switches. Right. Yeah, and I think that's, I, I think that's a, a really good point. As, as we look not at what's going on sort of underneath. Yeah. the history here. And I think that's really good. And I think sometimes that's, that's not a bad idea as you read this, because you've got questions that come up that, isn't, that aren't covered in these historical narratives. So it's nothing wrong with asking, you know, kind of a, that yours is sort of a sociological, religious question. You know, how do you abandon, how do you shift from one religion to another in a weekend. And be faithful you know, to that new religion. And, and, and feel something. Yes. You know, yeah. have, have any kind of a sense of dedication to it. Uh, yeah, that, see, that's an excellent question. And, you know, that, that goes all the way, you know, later with Christianity. I mean, good, good night. That's what we see early on when, you know, Clovis uh, of the um, Franks, when he converts to Christianity and he says to, he has his army march into a river. And you know what they did when they marched into a river? They drowned also. No, nope, didn't drown. It wasn't that deep. Oh, oh. They marched into a river and... Oh, they marked it. it baptized. Oh, Boom. Oh. You know, they were baptized. I thought they were... You know, bang. So now what are we? We were pagan yesterday and what are we now? Christians today. Christian. You know, uh, Constantine, uh, after he has the, the legend of his conversion, seeing the cross in the sky, has his army, uh, the Roman emperor has his army, uh, paint crosses on their shields. His army is now what? Christian. Amen. You know, and, and so that's, that's something that we see, you know, where rulers say, okay, boys, we're now this. <laughs> you know, from now on. And if you're scared of the king, you say, yes, hot sir. dog, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm, I like that cross. Yeah. Uh, looks much better than something else. So, hey, but that's, see, that's a, that's a good question here and as we look at all, all of history. Okay, so, so we've got this, this now we talked, I was talking about tone shift. What, what is the shift when we get into Ezra? Because if, if the books of the kings, you say, oh, these, these, that's best. Sometimes these, every now and then these people sound good, but usually they don't. And, you know, it's not a very optimistic and they're having wars and struggling and killing folks and all. What do we get when we move into to, uh, Ezra? We get them sharing or helping okay. him. Bringing, you know, yeah, we got offering. people sharing and we got people giving. Giving. And we've got the big thing is we got people wor working, wor working and, and worshiping, you know, the way they're supposed to, which we didn't run into a lot, you know. So we get this tonal shift. It's interesting that after the exile, they become much more optimistic. The writer is much more positive as he writes about the people and even here we're going to see a resolution to a problem and as we we look at it uh, today I want you to think back because we we had a very different situation in another book but a very similar people or pre people presented in a very similar way that end up they ended up resolving their problem in a similar way uh, they, going back to a, a book we've already looked at. Okay, so anyway, we've got, we've got Ezra. What, is, what are some of the things that have been happening in the book of Ezra? But, well, they were talking about like the intermarriage and... and okay, yeah. hold on. We're going to not say... Okay. Yeah, we're still kind of reviewing. Oh. We're getting to that. What, what are some of the things that have happened in Ezra before we get to what we're looking at today, before we get to the ninth chapter? Because Ezra didn't show up until no, totally. until late, you know, so he wasn't there at the beginning. What are some of the things we've we've gone through with Ezra? He's finally talking. He didn't talk. 
Okay, Ezra, Ed, Ed, yeah, after Ezra came, now he's, yeah. now he's more involved in working. Even before Ezra came. The king what? let the Jews come out. Okay, king lets the Jew, king of Persia lets the Jews, or, or what has become the Jews. The Jews are no longer 12 tribes. They are now two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin. You know, that's now, and the, the northern tribes are the northern tribes. And we don't really talk much about them. Uh, in fact, you know, sometimes Judah becomes associated with Israel. So all of a sudden, those tribes in the north have kind of faded a little bit. Aren't there like 13 tribes altogether? Well, yeah. there, there are 12 tribes, 12. but the, the northern tribes kind of disappear because the, the Levites are sort of in there because yeah. the Levites never have land. So they, they're still present. But the other tribes, the ten tribes in the north, just kind of vanish uh, and aren't talked much about. Not, at least not in a, in a positive way. Um, okay, so <clears throat> they come back. What else have they done after they come back? Because this is a positive, pretty positive story in, in Ezra. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the temple. They... They prepare for their own bazaar with roasters. Um, <laughs> and, um, oh, gosh. Yeah. I can't think of what they were doing, but all come to mind roasters. <laughs> Roaster. Exactly. Well, that's, yeah. we, 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 are, we are approaching Thanksgiving. <laughs> so they sacrifice turkeys um, on, the, okay. on an altar. Uh, so they, they start worship. And in fact, it even says they celebrate... Passover, which in a way they've never done, you know. So they are very religious people. Now they do all that. They rebuild the temple before Ezra even comes. And when Ezra comes, what does he kind of bring with it? And what we looked at last week was really his coming, his his arrival. What does he bring with it? The priest. Okay, he brings priests with him. Remember, he, he didn't have any Levites, and so he has to he calls Levites to come with him. And so we kind of get this second return with it, with Ezra and his group, people to and furnishings for the temple. Mm -hmm. um, that now the, the temple is ready to function, sacrifices a whole mess of animals when he gets there, and we're starting to cook, okay? So what, what is, who's, well first, who's driving this story? God is. Okay, God is driving the story. We know it, Ezra knows it, the writer knows it, right? And, and what would seem to be some of the factors that are uniting the people, these people who have returned? What's providing unity? What's holding them together? They're back home. Okay, one, they're coming back home and this is their land, so they have a sense of unity coming back home. What else is providing them unity? They have a temple to worship. Okay, they've got a temple to worship in a, their own yeah. city. Yeah. You know, the city of David, they've got a temple to worship and the worship itself is, is providing this, this unity. Uh, what, what might be... So we've got a united people that, are, that seem to be very religious people. What would be some factors that could get in the way of, of this unity? People from outside? Okay, maybe people from outside. Now, has that been a problem in the past? Yeah. Yeah, a, I mean, yes. a, 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 big, a, a big problem in the past, right? Because we saw that all the way through judges and the books of Samuel and Kings, that the people of the land who were in the land were a problem. And that's why when we look at Joshua, what was Joshua's command? What did God command Joshua to do? Kill everybody. Kill everybody. You know, so you're not going to have problems with people in the land because you are going to what? Kill every living thing. Every living thing, every man, woman, child, well, you would. I mean, it's it would be natural for 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 the people who are displaced to be, you know, off of like off of their land, and if somebody comes in and takes it over. Oh, sure, you sure. You know what I mean? They're not going to be happy about that. Yeah, they're not going to be. They're not going to be happy. Yeah. So they're going to fight. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and they're doing it. I mean, this is, that's what ethnic cleansing means. <laughs> you, know, you cleanse the land of the other group that you don't want there anymore. And uh, that's what we see. And so that, that cr- could create a problem for these new people because this new people are so, they're so focused and so united uh, in their land, with their temple, in their worship. Okay, and, and as we get to, we've kind of got that hanging around as we approach chapter 9. In fact, how does the writer begin chapter 9 of Ezra? He opposes intermarriage. What's that? He opposes intermarriage. True, yes, even before that. Would, how does he actually begin prayer? The, the, even before that. Looking at what the writer, what does the writer write at the very beginning of chapter 9? After these, after these things. Time. What is he talking about? When he says after these things, what is he talking about? Is he talking about all the, the building? They've built the temple. And okay, that's all we got about. all the they, stuff they, we've been talking all, about. All this all is, which, which tells us, because he's a writer, I mean, he's a good writer, he's doing what? He's moving from a topic to something else. To something else. I mean, this is a good, good transition. So, okay, this, all this that they have done. Now, he's also, the writer's also doing something interesting, too, because there's another shift. So, it would appear as though he's moving from one topic to another. What else is he doing in what he's writing here and will continue to do as he moves forward? Because there's a real shift. Ezra speaking. Ezra speaking. He shifted from third person. third person to first person. To first person. Now, why? Now, remember, this is a writer writing this down. I mean, he's rewriting this in his little work way after. This, this has occurred. Why might the writer do that? What, what might be his motivation from shifting from third person to first person? So, what, might he be, what might he be conveying? I'm sorry. That's okay. What might he be doing for his audience with respect to the audience, to, uh, for us, the reader, by making that shift? Letting us know that he's a really becoming a leader. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, it's that, that Ezra's a leader, is a real leader. What else? Why would a, why would a, I think you're right. Why would a writer, so he's reinforcing that, why else would a writer do that? And it's interesting, when you look like at the book of Acts, the writer of Acts does it three times. He'll shift from third person to first person, then back to third person, then first person, and then back to third person. He does it three times. Why would you do it? Why might a writer make that shift? Particularly this writer, because the writer of this book is an Ezra. You know, this is being written after Ezra. So the writer is choosing to shift into first person. It's not like he found this and said, just started to copy it. Why might he do that? Give it validity. Okay, bang. We got validity. And, and if he really wants what follows to have validity, what does that suggest about what's going to follow? It's very important. It must be important. It's got to be important, at least to the writer. Now, we may read it and say, I don't see why this is important. But the writer thought it was. So important that he didn't want to say, well, I heard about this. You know, third person, oh, I read about it. He says, I got an eyewitness. You know, and I got an eyewitness. That all of a sudden gives what's written real validity. I think it's, it's to put a, a stress and importance on what follows. This is big deal. This is big deal what's going to follow. Okay, so he shifts to this first person. Now it's Ezra who is speaking. What happens to Ezra? He finds out that they've been intermarrying. Okay. Mm -hmm. We got officials coming to him, right? And the officials tell him that they're intermarrying. And it's a lot of lot of details, you know, of like daughters marrying their fathers and sons marrying their sisters and and, and whatnot. Yeah, that they that they're marrying. What what's happening? What or what has happened? Well, Ezra's appalled by it. Well, I mean, true, but what, what 
it, or the officials telling him has occurred. I mean, as you read it, is it blatantly sinful? Do we have fathers marrying their daughters? And... No. no they're not, that's not incest. They're not talking about incest. What are they talking about? That's not incest. What is it? But what is, what well, is it happening? Well, it says they've taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves. So that's, that's incest. Well, but it, the, the problem isn't going to be incestuous. What's the problem? They're marrying foreigners. Oh, you know, yeah. they're, they're marrying foreigners. You know, the, the Jews, this people, they are marrying foreigners. You know, they're giving the daughters to foreigners. You know, their sons are marrying foreigners. Now, why would they be marrying foreigners? Nobody else to marry. Remember, we, one of the things they did is they moved, what the Babylonians did is they moved Jews out someplace else, moved foreigners in, and it wasn't the rich ones, it was the poor ones they left behind. And what did they start doing? They started marrying the people there. You know, that's, that's what they, that's they, what they did. Well, <laughs> that's what they did, you know. And, and so they, you have these, these foreign marriage. Now, what's really interesting, though, is when they present this. So in the land they're marrying, we've got mixed marriages. You know, mixed marriages. What does the, as the people speak to it, the officials, what do they connect? Now, we're, we're talking about people marrying these people in Judah, or the Jews marrying foreigners. What does, what does the speak of these officials, what do they connect? That they could be worshiping other Yes, they, they connect the people and the practices. So in other words, they're not saying... You know, our people are marrying Moabites, and the Moabites are becoming good, good Jewish people, girls and good Jewish men. Not saying that. They're, they're connecting the people with the practice, right? Okay. And, and they're, they're, they're doing it. And, and what's, what's been the result? Okay, their their own people now. Their own people are are in faith. This holy seed, right, is being mixed. Boy, that almost sounds Nazi, like a Nazi. The pure blood is being mixed by these foreign introduction of foreigners is is polluting is polluting the blood. Now, for Israel, why has that been a problem? Why has that been an issue? By what you know. Yeah, about Israel. It's happened before. Lord have mercy, it happened before. You remember examples of when it happened before? Well, wasn't David one of his wives? He made, made, built a special room for her to worship her idol, her God. Remember, it wasn't David, but it was Solomon. Mm -hmm. Solomon in his palace, because he married an Egyptian. And in his palace, in the palace he built, he builds a special place. And remember, it says Solomon has other wives. And he allows, not only does he allow them to set up shrines and altars all over the country, always in the high places, because you're closer to God, to heaven, you know, but he will actually participate in their worship. Doesn't mean he's not sacrificing at the temple, but he's participating in the worship. So this, this has happened. So we can assume, based on this word of God, that it is wrong, wrong, wrong to marry foreign girls. A man to marry foreign girls and a woman to marry a foreign boy. It's wrong. Pollutes the blood. Yes, no? Yeah, well, that's what they're saying. Oh, that's what it looks like. Well, it's very, it's interesting. If you look at Matthew, New Testament. Certainly that's what's being presented here, right? Because they've married these foreign women and the connection, and foreign men, and the connect, but particularly women. Uh, the, uh, the connection between the people and the practice are, are tight. You know, there's no mention that they're going to convert these foreigners. The foreigners are going to pollute themselves. What's, what's interesting, and so this is an idea that certainly floated here, Evidently, based on what we're going to see later, does the writer 
subscribe to this idea? Yeah, he does. Because we're going to see at the end, things get better when they leave. Yeah, when they, you know, you, you separate. It's, it's really, so this is an idea floating around, but I think this is one of the things that makes scripture so exciting to work with. Because if we just view this, well, this is absolute, then, you, you know, mixed marriages ain't going to work. You know, that's just wrong, wrong, wrong. And I've heard many Christians say that, you know, unequally yoked, which yeah. is kind of yeah. misusing something from Paul. But that's okay. You know, that's wrong. Well, it's kind of interesting just as, you know, to, to um, modify or to put this in context. Uh, when you look at the first chapter of, of Matthew, and if somebody has it, would you turn to chapter 1 of Matthew? Put your thumb where you are in, in Ezra. And just turn to, because the first chapter of Matthew, the first 17 verses, is, you know, it, I think nearly everybody loves those verses. Do you want Matthew what? Matthew 1, 1 through 17. I mean, it's, it's one that you have kids memorize. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is just a real special passage. It's always been meaningful to me. You're laughing. Why are you laughing? Actually, actually, it is. It, 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 it is really meaningful to me. Matthew 1. And, and I, no, but you're right. I said it to get that response. Uh, but it, it, it really is significant because you've got a whole bunch of names, right? And some of the names we recognize and some of the names we don't recognize. But what is really, really interesting in that list is there are almost all of them are men. All of them, almost all of them. Yeah. Do they have divorce? Do you, yes, yeah, they do. there was divorce. Yeah. Um, almost all of them were, were men, with four exceptions. All right. There are four. There are four exceptions. If you could scan it really fast, and and I'll give you a hint. All of them occur before verse seven. There are four. There are four exceptions. Four women are mentioned in that list. Can you pluck them out? Rahab. Okay, with Rahab, Tamar, Ruth, and now she's not mentioned by name. Oh, but she's mentioned at the end of verse six. Princess Jesse, the Uriah's? The, the, the whole mother had been Uriah's wife. The wife of Uriah, which is? Bathsheba. Bathsheba is the wife of Uriah. Four, four women are mentioned in that list, that genealogy. Well, that's strange. Isn't it? What an odd group. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Hmm, that's really strange. You would think... Who would be mentioned? If you were going to list some women, you'd mention, what's that? Mary. Yeah, you'd mention Mary. You'd mention, if you were going to mention Old Testament women. Ruth. Well, you'd mention Sarah. Sarah for crying out loud. You'd mention Rebecca. You'd mention Rachel. You know, you'd, Eve. Jeez Louise. <laughs> you'd mention those people. Tamar? Who the heck is Tamar? You remember? We talked about her. Way back in Genesis. Kinda, excuse me, too funny. She kind of sounds like a spice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, she was kind of spicy. Do you remember the story of Tamar? <laughs> she, she, she slept with her father-in-law. She tricked him. She played dressed like a prostitute. And no. slept with Judah, you know, her her father-in-law, and the thing with the signet ring and the staff, and she was ready. He was ready to kill her when she was pregnant, and she said, "By the way, does anybody know who these belong to?" And Judah says, "Oops, only said it in Hebrew, which makes it sound better." Uh, so Tamar. Ooh, that's not a very glorious story. Well, it's got to get better. Rahab, I mean, she was an example of faith and dedication and all, right? Who? Rahab. Rahab. Mm -hmm. She's a prostitute. Yeah. Oops, a prostitute. Now, if Tamar acted like a prostitute, Rahab 
didn't have to act. Ooh. Well, it's got to get better than that. What, what, what? Ruth. Okay, we do Ruth. What's the, what's the story of Ruth? What's happening? Now, Ruth has got to be better. Well, yes, yeah, yeah, she laid down in his feet, and uh, feet's a euphemism for something else. You know, it just is. You know, let me just say that in Ezekiel, where the angels had their four wings and one covered their face and the other covered their set covered their feet, wasn't talking. It was because the angels were modest. Uh, also, Ruth was. She had another problem. Ruth was a Moabite. Ruth was was a foreigner. Ruth was a foreigner, and by the way, so was Rahab. Was a foreigner. Uh, Rahab was a foreigner, Ruth was a foreigner. She was a Moabite. And I'm not sure anybody is going to teach their daughter, wants their daughter to grow up like Bathsheba. Uh, no, I would no. That's not. That's not what you would choose. So in, in Matthew, when Matthew lists, and he's doing it, he's choosing to do it, he's picking the names. Mm -hmm. He's making a conscious decision not to put Sarah and Rachel and Rebecca as part of his list. Instead, he's including some women who had less than glory. It's the only women less than glory. How do you think, what do you think Matthew's opinion about the value of foreign or even fallen people are based on his genealogy? What do you think his opinion of of foreign women, the women that right here in Ezra, you want out. What do you think Matthew's view is? Not real good. Wait, does Matthew have a higher view? Does, would he say, Ezra, you did the right thing. Foreign women are scum. Got to get them out. No. Pollutes no. the people. Ah, God. Jesus wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have been if it hadn't been for Ruth. Mm -hmm. Because David wouldn't have been if it hadn't been for a foreigner. That's what makes scripture exciting. Because Ezra seems so <laughs> clear. And then bang, we got Matthew, this genealogy, and now it ain't clear at all. You know, therefore we can't say, well, it says it here, that's what we should do, because it says something very different here. And the people who include, who worked with this knew that. And that's why we have to interpret. We have to be real careful and diligent and interpreting and willing to say, I may be wrong, you know, based on this. Mm -hmm. And we sort of have to struggle. Anyway, but, and I wanted to mention that right now because I hear people say um, about foreign polluting the blood. You know, our blood is being polluted by foreign. We gotta be real careful mm -hmm. and, and grounding it on something in scripture. It ain't here, unless you're gonna disregard the Gospel of Matthew. You know, we gotta be, we gotta be real careful. But it certainly is here in Ezra. You know, so we have to deal with that as well. Okay. So we got Ezra. This is a, a problem. And what is the time frame that uh, the, um, as the officials present this to Ezra, gives them a little time frame, or the writer gives us a time frame that this is during this period. You know, they have had these gen 14 generations. Kind of interesting. There's a symmetry. And this tells us a little bit about what the writer values, that he likes this 14, 14, 14. There's some kind of a numeric symmetry going on. Okay, Ezra hears this news. This is the verses 1 and 2. Ezra hears this news. How does he receive it? This news that Jewish boys are marrying foreign girls, and foreign girls are marrying Jewish boys. He goes into mourning. Oh, he goes into mourning. And is it, is it a subtle morning? I don't. <laughs> what is he doing? Pulling his hair out. He's pulling his hair out. See, I used to mourn. I don't <laughs> anymore. I can't afford to. Um, he's pulling his hair. <laughs> <laughs> laughing too hard. 
dab way no, too hard. <laughs> All right. So he's there. He's mourning in a very dramatic way, and he is. And again, the writer is telling us this, right? He is, why is he mourning with such intensity? He is, what's that? Shocked. He is shocked by what he's, by this news, right? And of the people around him, how do the other people around him um, react? Okay, they are, they are trembling, right? So they're also here, and, and what do these, they see? And the writer's telling us here. He's telling us how we should see this situation. What is the situation? Why is this? Why does Ezra tear out his hair and his beard and tear up his clothes? And why are people trembling? What is the problem? He's appalled. He's appalled. Why is he appalled? He tells us. Why is he appalled? The lack of faithfulness among his people. That's the problem. Okay. Fundamental problem. So what does... So the writer tells us, this is a question of faith. This isn't a question of biology or sociology or politics. It is a question of faith. These people who are intermarrying are not faithful. And what does Ezra do? Of course, what does Ezra do? Pray to God. He goes to God because he is a dedicated person, right? And he is on his knees and his clothes are all torn up, which tells us we know his state of mind, right? Mm -hmm. And what does he say to God? Shame. Shame. Okay, he is, he is ashamed. Now, as he does this prayer, what in a sense is he, is he doing? Which is kind of interesting. Admitting he didn't see this was going on. Okay, didn't see this was going on. You know, this was happening and he wasn't aware of it. Why is he feeling shame? Because he wasn't aware. Be well, is he... He didn't... He what, didn't. what makes him feel shame? Because they went against God. Okay, good. It's not, it's not a personal, well, you know, the people are going to be people, and I just didn't see it. It's, I feel shame because of what God. the people did. Yeah. You know, that's what, almost like he's taking it in on himself. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel, not that I don't have a foreign wife, I feel shame because my people did. Yeah. And, and how is this, what, what is this doing to him? How is this affecting him? What the people have done? What does it appear as though it has happened as Ezra is going to God in prayer? And that's why it's first person because we're hearing Ezra pray. What has the sins of the people, how, have those effect, how has that affected him? Well, he's saying that from the beginning from their forefathers and until now, the guilt has been great. Okay, so it's been a big problem in the past. Yeah. How is that affecting him now? He's fearing the consequences. Okay, he's fearing consequences. There's, there's this, this gap that's developed because of this. Now, now he shifts to the past, right? How does all this, what they're doing now, relate to the past? Well, it says because of our sins, they've been suggested. Subjected to sword and captivity. So, okay. as a result of their sins, all this has happened where they were exiled and okay. brought back. And so, the, the exile was caused by the power of the Babylonians, the weakness of the kings of Judah. The exile was caused by sin. By sin. sin. And God, right? Mm -hmm. So, they are responsible and God has has done it. And, and, but now what has God done? So, but that was in the past, right? So what has God, well, the distant past. In the immediate past, what has God done? So we, he, all of this has happened. We were thrown into exile because we were sinful. Now, given the, set, the fact that the situation has to do with intermarrying, you know, and like you said, you have all these examples from the books of the kings where, you know, foreign wives lead kings astray, you know, 
Uh, so it's something we can see in the story itself that their exile is, was deserved. They deserve to get what they got. What has God now done? Grace. He showed them a little bit of grace. And what is a little bit of grace he's shown? He saved a remnant. He saved a remnant. And this idea of remnants is a big deal. We're in, on Thursday evening, we're, we're studying Romans. And the remnant's a big deal in Romans 11. So that's, that's, that's an idea we see in the, the New Testament. The God preserved a remnant. We see it in other places in the Old Testament. That's what, when uh, Elijah was so upset that he felt he was the only prophet around. And God says, huh, I got 7,000 that I've set aside. There's a remnant here. So you are not alone. And that, that's what uh, Ezra is suggesting. God preserved a remnant, but it's a different remnant, right? What, what has he done with this remnant that he set aside? What has he done with them? He brought them back. He brought them back. Yeah. They, they paid the price they were you know, expected to pay. I mean, they paid the consequences for their action, but God is gracious and brought a remnant, this remnant back, even though they are still in slavery. You know, they are not free, right? Now, what, what has motivated God's action? Because they disobeyed him. Okay, they would disobey, and, and now he is making them pay. He's for brought them. them, he's brought them back, right? They, and they pay it, and he brought them back. What has right here at the beginning of the prayer, what has Ezra done, and what has the writer done for us, the reader? What has he done right at the beginning of the prayer? Talks to God. What's that? He's praying to God. He's well, he is, he is praying for God. As we read the prayer, what is the writer doing for us? Confessing. Us what's that? Confessing. He's, he's confessing, right. That's, that's what we've got. He's confessing what's happened in the past. Okay, because in verse 10, we've got a shift, right? You know, all of this has happened in the past. Now we've got a little shift in verse 10. How does that confession change a little bit in verse 10? Because before verse 10, you know, he's saying, you know, the past, we paid the consequences, we did wrong, we paid the consequences, God is gracious, he brought us back, all of this is great. How does that, how does it kind of shift a little bit in verse 10? But what did, he was asking, like, God, what, what do we do now to... Um, conquer this sin that's still happening. Okay. Current. Okay. So this has happened in the past. We paid and you were gracious. Now we've got something else going on. And and what is it they that they have forsaken God's command and in particular what command have the people? And this is it as we're in prayer, what have the people forsaken? What command have they forsaken? What command have they turned from? Uh, um, they, they're intermarrying. Okay? And the, the pollution of the people in the, in the land. Again, this connection between people and practice. You know, what the people, the, the people, foreign people do foreign things. And that's a danger for, for Israel. No, 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 no. Now, where is he getting this? Because he says, he suggests that this is God's command. Well, where is he getting this command? That he suggests that people are violating. From the law. Okay, he's getting it from the law. And in particular, it's a lot of stuff, little, little verses in Deuteronomy about intermarrying, that you're not, that you're not supposed to intermarry. So what, what is Ezra here suggesting that the people, what have they done? Right now, these, these people to whom God has shown grace, in spite of the fact that they, their ancestors deserved what they got, what are these new people, these restored people, these dedicated and righteous people, what, what are they violating? They're violating the commandments, and commandments are part of something bigger, right? 
What are the commandments part of? It's a big deal for the Jews. And we've talked about it a lot. Covenant. covenant. They're violating covenant, right? Because in that covenant, God gives commands, right? God's going to be gracious. The commands, we obey. We've got this covenant created, this contract created. And by doing this, the people there in the land are violating this covenant. Now, what does the writer remind the reader? In verse 13. It's a result of their evil deeds. Okay. It's their fault. Okay. So, we know what happens when you break the commandments, right? When you break the commandments, what happens? You pay the price. price. That's the way it is. When you break the covenant, there are consequences. So, what does he ask? He asks two, in this prayer, he asks two rhetorical questions. What does he ask? Um, Don't destroy us. Yeah, we paid in the past. We broke the commandments in the past and we were in exile for 14 generations, right? Finally, you brought us home. We're violating the commands right now. You said God's promising less. Yeah, should we? What's the first rhetorical question? Be destroyed? Yeah, should we break your commandments again? You know, and intermarry with people who or in the land? Should we do that? Rhetorical question. What's the answer? No. He's not exactly, well, duh. You know, the answer is duh. Yeah. No. So what's the next one that he asks? Um, Did you not destroy Yeah, would, would God, would you, God, would you, and this is, these are questions he's asking God. He didn't need an answer. You know, the first question is, should we violate your commandments? God, you think that's a good idea? The answer is no. Well, are you going to be, are you going to be upset if we violate your commandments? Duh, yes. So how does the confession end? It said, uh, here we are. Yeah, we are before you and our guilt. Okay. So, this is truly confession. Mm -hmm. This is is what we've done. Now, why would, and this this is a big deal for Ezra, and certainly a big deal for the one who's writing Ezra's story here. Why would intermarrying present such a danger in this context? Why would the intermarrying with foreigners present such a danger? An incredible danger in this kind because because of what they might bring. Okay, what the, you know their their whatever their religion their their ports are they might bring that into this and, and mess it up. Okay, yeah. why is that such a danger for these people at this time? I don't know if they could handle it at that time. Why not? I think you're right. Why not? Why would it be particularly? Dangerous for them at this time. Well, because they they just were forgiven. They were brought back. They were the remnant that was brought back to their homeland. Right. So if they start off on the wrong foot, they're doomed. They, they they're going to be doomed. What's going to happen to What's going to happen to Judah? God will punish them. Well, God will punish them. What's going to happen to Judah? It's just not going to be worshiping God. You're going to have tons of idols. Yeah, you you're just going to be like. You're going to be like everybody else, right? You're just going to be like everybody else. And it's kind of interesting. That's what the people of Judah are going to say about another group of people. The people of Samaria. They're going to say that's why in the New Testament, Samaritans are never viewed in a positive light. Well, that's wrong. The gospel writer, the evangelists view them in a positive light Primarily because the Jews did not. Samaritans were half-breeds. They were awful. They were a mixed race. They were a polluted race. That's not nice. You know, we are pure. They are not. And Jews didn't trust them. And the Samaritans didn't trust the Jews either because you got this animosity. But that's why the Jews didn't like those, the people who lived in the land of the ten tribes. They didn't like them. You know, because they were, they, they had become the danger presented here. They've just become a mixed, a mixture of a lot of different 
ideas and things. Okay, becomes it. They need their own identity. They need that identity to survive. And that identity is going to be really, really important all the way to today. You know, this identity of people of God, the people of the law. Okay, so this, this is a big deal for them. Now, what is, hap- what is happening as Isaiah is praying? That's true. What is he doing as he's praying? A crowd gathered. <laughs> okay. Is 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 Ezra Ezra's crying and the crowd gathers and what are the crowds doing? Crying bitterly. What they're crying too and and who speaks? Shechaniah. Shechaniah. Shechaniah speaks and what does he say? What does Shechaniah say? We've been unfaithful to our God by marrying four women. We've done it. Mm-hmm. You know, Ezra, you are 100% right. Okay? And so, what should they do? What does he suggest that they do? Make another covenant. Okay, we need to make another, another covenant. Okay? And so, how does he suggest they go about doing that? And, and remember, the, the problem is this covenant is going to involve doing what? Okay. Because he's very clear about what this covenant involves. They'd have to send them away. Sending them away. Send them, yep. N- not just, we won't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not going to do it anymore. They're going to have to send away their wives, and they're going to have to send away their children. Their children. Their children. Now, why does that become? really important, even more significant then than it may be now. Because of the children aren't pure? Well, the, 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 yes, these foreign, these mixed-race children. Why would that be, you know, we read that and say, oh boy, that's hard. Family split, oh, that'd be difficult. Why is it even more dramatic here, in this context? It'd be a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Taken away from yeah. the Country. And yes, and remember, we're talking about an age where population, and see, we miss this a lot. We look at the population of the world doing what? Population of the world, yeah. boy, that's a problem. You know, some societies like China have, and sometimes miss, have done it in a wrong way. We got to find a way to stop this spiking of the population because eventually we ain't going to be able to feed all these people. You know, there are too many people. So we got to find ways to keep the population from growing so fast. we got to put some, some limits to this. That's not the world here. Population is like a line. It is static. Which means your society depends on people coming in. Because as many people are coming in as are going out. So your society ceases to exist if the population drops too far. It, it just stops existing. And what they're proposing is sending away the kids and the people who produce the kids. And that's a big deal. But they're doing it for what reason? Security. They're doing it because that's what God wants them to do. They believe that's what's God's. This is a big cost. And that's something we're going to talk about in just a little bit. When they, when they say this, you know, he makes this confession. He's not, you know, he's not saying, well, forgive us and we just won't do it anymore. They're going to pay a huge price. Confession without cost may not be confession at all. Or confession without consequences. And the consequences here are pretty dramatic that they're accepting you know, that we're going to have to send away our children. Okay, so how is he going to work this out? How, what suggestion does he offer about how they can figure out how to restore this, this covenant with God or how to make a new covenant with God? Shechaniah, what, what does he suggest that they do? All that had been exiled, come and meet. Okay, first he says, Ezra... You get together a group and think about it. <laughs> you know, work it out because you're the leaders. 
you know, work it out and, and let us know what conclusion you come to. And the conclusion is, what does uh, Ezra suggest they do? They need to come together, right? We need to get every... Who's going to come together? Everybody. Where are they going to meet? They're going to meet in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Jerusalem. That's where the temple is. That's where the temple is. That's the center of their society. And everybody's supposed to be there. Lord have mercy, hotels must have been full. Because you got people, everybody there, everybody from Judah is gathered in Jerusalem, right? And, and in fact, if you don't come, what if you don't come? You lose all your property. You lose your property. Okay, you, you lose all your property and you all, will also be what? Not only will you lose your property, you'll be you're going to be expelled. You are going to become a foreigner too. Whoa. Now, this is then really, really important, them being here, coming. Do they have to round people up according to what follows? Do, pe do the people come? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. What does that show? Again, the writer's opinion of these people. They were obedient. Okay. Now notice, the writer has done what? He shifted again to third person. Mm -hmm. He's not first person anymore. Mm -hmm. Ezra's not described. Once Ezra's prayer ends, he moves away from first person. We're back into third. Okay. So we got all the people here, and, and he's very specific. What tribes are there? Judah and Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin. We are not talking about Naphtali or Issachar. We're talking about Judah and Benjamin. They are all there, and it's kind of interesting. Um, what, what is, what's happening? Phys physically, what's it's going raining. on? It's raining. It's raining. Which is, which is kind of interesting that he mentions it. Well, they're all sitting outside, though. Yeah. You all gathered out there and yeah. it's raining on them. And it's raining on them. Yeah. Okay. And what does Ezra do? Um, he stood up and said to them, you have been unfaithful to have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Okay. And what does he command his people to do, first of all? Confess. you got to confess. And what are they confessing? They're that they've done wrong. <clears throat> That they've done wrong. And that should be enough of them, right? Once you confess, then you're good. You get a stamp on your forehead, confess, go in peace. We're not gonna hold it against you. You just go and do it again. Yeah, if you do that. So what do they what else do they have to do? You gotta confess, which means acknowledge that you've done wrong, and you gotta do what? You gotta send them away. You, you got to send them away. Why are both of those acts important? Because well, you just, you just said. Why? Yeah, because it, of family. Well, family, but it, why, why won't he just say, you need to confess your sins. And once you've confessed your sins, we are good. And then they just do it again. That doesn't create yeah. the problem. It'll happen again. It'll happen again. Which may tell us something about confession, right? You know, because I run into a lot of people who, who seem to think, say that confession is internal. You know, you confess internally. Between you, it's something between you and God. And you don't have to do anything about it on the outside. Just on the inside. It's confessing to God. Is that what the confession here is about? No. You know, if you confess something's wrong, then you got to, and this seems like a, another duh statement, but I don't know that it is. If you say that, if you say I confess I'm doing something wrong, what do you need to do? Yeah. You need to quit doing it. Yeah. You know, and if you're doing something wrong and you've got, you know, you benefited from it, you know what? You, give what you, you may need to give up what you've got. Yeah. You know, maybe that's part of confession. You know, maybe. Certainly, it would seem to be here. That's what he says, right? And what response does it do you receive? I agree. Now, they say, I agree. Now, right here, I am experiencing deja vu all over again. Because we see a very similar thing happen in the book of Joshua. 
And remember I mentioned that the people in Joshua are presented, I think, in a, in a way much like the people who returned from the exile. They are united, they are dedicated, and they have a leader that is really dedicated. And remember in Joshua, at the end, when he reads, they read the law, the people are standing, and they, the law is read from the mountain. And they hear the law, and Joshua says, you know, as for today you have to choose. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And the people respond by saying, well, we'll think about it. Is that what the people say? Heck no. The people say, Amen. Amen. We, we will serve the Lord too. And that's what's happening here. Ezra does the same sort of thing Joshua did. And I think the writer's smart enough to know that he's, this is a neat little parallel. Got everybody gathered together. You know, and when he says this is something we got to do, the people say, "Yes, this is what we got to do. This is what we." It's sort do. of like what's going on today between me. We have a president who's elected and supposed to, you know, to like lead his people, and not all of his people uh, follow exactly what he says. You know what I mean, or what he wants to happen in in our in our lives. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's sort of the, it's. You know what I mean? You have a president who is leading, and mm -hmm. all these. Senator, different things like that. Right. You know, we're supposed to lead the people in the right direction, but are they? No. Well, this is, it's, yeah, it's, it's really, in, in this case, he makes a statement, Ezra makes a statement, this is, and we, we've been set up for this, right? What Ezra is saying, we, we believe, right? Because we haven't read. Nobody in the back of the room says, Ezra, <laughs> what about Ruth? Yeah. You're forgetting Ruth. What about Rahab? You know, nobody does that because the writer's not going to have anybody do that because the writer is presenting a unified people with a clear, clear focus. Okay? And the people agree, but what's... They, they say, you're right, we need to do that, but <coughs> there's a little appendix to it. In verse 13. There are many people here, and it's a rainy season, so we cannot stand outside. We are all, there's a lot of us here, and we are really wet. And when you're wet, you're uncomfortable. Yeah, you know, you're, you're uncomfortable. So maybe now's not the best time to figure out what I'm going to do with my wife who's standing beside me. You know, maybe this isn't the time to say bye. Yeah. You know, maybe we need to... But a couple of days. Then maybe we need a couple of days and we need to have some kind of process. Well, you know, to figure, to figure this out. Now, why... Now, this actually makes a lot of sense. Why might you want a little process? Because you've married, you've loved the woman, maybe had children to, to that woman or whatever, and then you've got to send her away with your kids. Well, yeah. Yeah, you, there well, may be something even easy. as basic as, as, is she a foreigner? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But it's not going to be easy regardless of whether she's a foreigner or not. No, none of this is going to be know. easy. So what, the, what they I suggest, yeah, what they suggest is, <laughs> let us go home, <laughs> you know, let us get out of this rain, let us go home, and then what? We'll, we'll send them away. Come back, we'll, get Certain time. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you pick some people to sort of adjudicate this, to figure this thing out, and what the people agree to is what we will, mm -hmm. what we will follow, right? And what what ends up happening, and and the purpose is so that God isn't going to be angry with us. So we're keeping the covenant. You know, so the covenant is going to be kept. And what, what ends up happening? Ezra, Ezra picked people. Ezra picks people. To command and so on. <laughs> goes and investigates cases and yeah. goes to the villages. And when a person, or the examples he gives, 
when the person finds that they have a foreign wife that they have to send away, what, what does that person end up doing? Which I find really fascinating. Which again, may say a lot about confession. He doesn't just send her away. He offers a sacrifice. He offers a sacrifice. An animal on the altar. He makes a sacrifice. So it's, it's sort of that acknowledgement that sin, a sin offering to God. That's mm -hmm. what he does. Because he, he sinned, uh, at least as it's defined here. So as we get to the end of Ezra, what's the situation, what's the condition of the people? What's the condition of God's people? The end. When we get to the end of Ezra. They would be just back to the Israelites, the, the original. They are as <laughs> close to they're as close to the people we've had at the end of Joshua as we can get, right? They are they are focused. They are absolutely dedicated. Uh, they are united as as one. What uh, now? A, as we look at just what's presented. Because we've got a story that I'm not sure I'm going to preach a series of sermons on encouraging husbands and wives to separate, yeah. you know, send one another away because you're unequally yoked. Yeah. Um, what, does, what does this, what might we take from this with respect to confession? When I read that, was reading it today, I was really struck by that. What, what lesson might we take with respect to confession? May even be a modification with the way we view confession. Mm -hmm. At least maybe, maybe the way I view, have viewed confession. Well, do you think sometimes when, when, when people confess, okay, their sins and they know what they've done wrong, but they kind of put a little niche in there? You know, okay. So they can, Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and and sometimes I think we kind of encourage that, you know, that if you you confess, you go to God, and you go to God by yourself in prayer, and you confess, and you leave clinging. Mm -hmm. But you, it hasn't cost you anything. There are no consequences. You have exactly what you had before, and even even if you stop doing what you're doing. He hadn't paid anything. There'd been no consequences. Maybe this modifies. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, like I said, it just hit me as I was working through this. So, you know, so maybe we cheapen confession. Maybe we make confession a little, little cheaper than it should be. What Also, one of the things I think we really need to take seriously is what makes this situation unique. Before we start going out and, and saying blood is being polluted, before we start doing that kind of stuff, what makes this situation unique enough that we might want to modify it with what Matthew writes at the beginning of his gospel and what Paul writes, you know, in Corinthians about when you're married to, when Christians are married to non-Christians, that, you know, Paul doesn't say get rid of them. You know, what makes this situation kind of unique? People just came back from being <clears throat> dispersed and intermixed with a large number of right. different peoples. Right. So this is really a... Yeah. So this is Word of God. It's a unique... That's why you kind of have to interpret it. Also something to file away. The book of Ruth, and there's no question that Ruth's a Moabite. The book of Ruth is written after this because the language is Aramaic. So it's it's a it's a more it's a later language, although the story is earlier. You know, the book of Ruth, the the Moabite, the foreigner, is the hero in the book of Ruth, and in fact is the one who shows the most faith. Uh, so clearly, even in this world, people didn't say, well, foreigners are bad. You know, you just are bad, they're just bad. Because Ruth isn't. No, so yes. we've got we've got both of these stories together. How do you handle them when they're together? Sometimes you struggle with it, yeah. and that's what the Bible is about. The Bible isn't about finding verses that answer all the questions, but to really struggle, think about, pray about, discuss, 
meaning and application. That's what interpreting means. And I think that's what inspiration means. The Spirit is constantly guiding us as we do that. Yeah. So, at least in my opinion. Now, next week, we are done with Ezra. Ezra's finished. And we still have, with, with the people established in the land, they still have a problem. And, as, and Nehemiah is going to address the problem that we still have. But I don't want to give a spoiler alert. You'll see the problem in Nehemiah. And we'll look at Nehemiah 1.1 1, 1 through 20, 20, uh, through 2020. Thank you very much. Yeah. Through 220. 220. Okay. The beginning, first couple of chapters of Nehemiah. Yeah. yeah. Chapter 3, verse 15 of 10. Talks about only Jonathan opposing mm -hmm. yes. the whole plan. Yes. Is there, there's no way that's the same Jonathan that would be David's son, no. just time wise. Or just yeah, it, it's not. So then why is that even in there? 15, like, well, you didn't address it. And really, what is the purpose of that? Why do you think it's there? And, and by the way, why do, you think, why do you think Jonathan objected to the plan? What was his objection? Why do you think? Okay, do you, do you think he objected? Do you think his objection was, I don't think we should have to send away our foreign wives? Or was his objection, I don't see why we have to go back to our villages. I don't know why we came to it now. And I, I tend to think, based on what I saw earlier, what we read earlier, is the people who objected were objecting to, we don't need this plan. We can do it now in the rain, and we should. So in other words, I, I think one of the reasons it may be here, one is part of the tradition, so people would have known. It, I think it shows that some people were even more dedicated, that they weren't willing to wait. One they, man out of all. One, yeah, one but, but he wanted it done now. And we see in the rest of the story that they do this plan and it's not, you know, a plan so that some people avoid it. You know, it's to muddy the water. Everybody sends away that foreign wives. There's nobody here with foreign wives at the end of Ezra. It's done. The foreign wives are gone and the foreign children are gone. Where they go, I don't know, but they ain't there anymore. You know, they've been sent away. Which, if you looked at it in, in a historical context of economics, this is horrible. You know, they're just sending women and children. You know, just who's gonna God, feed you're them? sorry. Who's going to feed their they're children? Gonna, they, nobody. You know, there's a reason why women and, and children are the lowest rung of the social ladder. They don't survive. So, you know, this is horrible. If we look at it as, as just objective history, this is, not a, this is not a nice story. If we look at this as theological, you know, there's a reason they're doing it as a way of being closer to God. How can we be closer? You know, what are some of the things that we're doing that may interfere with our relationship with God and how can we deal with it? Well, Rather than how can we deal with, you know, foreign wives, you know, kind of Well, thing. if the foreign wives and children converted to, to Christianity... Can't be. You can't. Well, not here. Because the, the, the danger of bringing the... Because the people and the practices are the same. The people and the practices are a Moabite acts like a Moabite. A Moabite does not become a Jew. He's a Moabite. And so there's no conversion. That's not that's not even entertained here. Okay. So but I think that's I think I think that's the reason that that this guy was sort of hyper dedicated. He wanted it done now. No, uh, because there's no mention that he's excluded, you know, he, but that, that he wanted it done. So, and, and maybe as maybe the writer throws that in because maybe he suspects that the reader, as the reader hears the plan, the reader may think, hey, this seems like it may be a way to avoid, you know, actually doing what you <laughs> promised to do. And then by the end of the story, we see that everybody submits to this and when they are, when they're told to, send away their foreign wives. They do. 
I, I, I have no idea. I, I don't even know what to say. Well, of um, course, she couldn't have any more because she's had lunch uh, and I gave well, her. Well, she's got, yeah, she's got yes, lunch. And coming. I didn't give her as much as I usually do, so, you know, Coco. you should eat her. Here, yeah, she's yeah. Coco. She's 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 yeah. She's to and I hope you know she has a she has a new harness. All right. Uh, she's got a brand new harness because the other one was getting kind of ratty. Yeah. Yeah. And this is more. This is going to be more durable because we've had harnesses that were covered with cloth, and the cloth tends to get a little ratty. What size so, do you get her? She she wears a medium. And, and that's, you know, we, I've always looked at her as a small dog, not a tiny dog, yeah. but a small dog. And so we were getting small things and, you know, yeah. and she's got a, she's got a cute little overcoat. Oh, yeah. This oh, pink goodness. has some faux pockets on it, fur around the coat. Yeah. Oh. Not that she's spoiled anything, but she's got, she has, a, and it's, you know, getting it on her, it's, it's kind of tight. And and so oh, poor baby. you know, I read I just assumed she was small. Small dog, get her small, small stuff. Yeah. And I read and then, you know, small, no more, uh, or a medium, um, between thirteen and twenty pounds. Well she's you know, like sixteen pounds. Is she huh. really? Well, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, that maybe she's a medium. And and so I started getting her medium stuff and uh, it works out yes, well. She's got she's got a a medium. She has a a, a medium uh, raincoat. Oh well, Lily uh, has her own umbrella. Well, see, that's even better. Yeah, dog umbrella. <laughs> yeah, but is, does Lily does Lily have a reversible raincoat? Because on one side it's yellow, and on the other side there are little ducks. Um, no, she on, doesn't have on a her. Person. Okay. Hers has a hood. So, with, with a little hood. Yeah, she doesn't like that. Okay. Don't worry, honey, I'll get you. <laughs> we're we're walking down the street and she's wearing her little her little raincoat. She has a movie for She doesn't. She should. Yeah. yeah. Word of advice, don't use that same logic when you're buying things for Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go smaller. Uh, <laughs> Her return if it doesn't yes. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate that word. I, I I just never buy her any clothes. <laughs> well we uh, we uh, we went through that at the early on. That she the trouble was, and now I'm, now this is like true confession. Um, the the trouble was Debbie values gifts. She she puts an importance on a gift that's received. Well see I, I don't. A gift is something to use, you know. It, it may be nice, it may be decorative, but it's it's it has a purpose. And if I've got it, the fact that it's a gift doesn't make it any make difference. it any different. Um, uh, especially if it's a gift I've received that I've also paid for, you know, <laughs> that come from a joint checking account. You know, I'd rather get something I can wear, you know, than to get something that I that I can't. Uh, but Debbie doesn't see Debbie the gift just the act of giving becomes important. I guess that sounds more noble as I say it out loud. I understand that. So when when I gave yeah. I would give Debbie I would give Debbie clothes not a lot of clothes but something clothes that I think she would that I thought she'd look good in. I, I also have a I, I'm a little cheap. Uh, so <laughs> when I buy clothes, it's it's a it's a little cheap. Yeah. Uh, it's a little on the cheap side, and, and so but it looks nice. Um, it's sometimes even used, but I don't even want to get there. Uh, so I give it to her, and and she won't she won't return it. So she keeps it, but never wears it. And and I'm thinking that's cr not crazy. It's crazy for me, you know, to buy something that I know she's not going to like, because I know it, because um, she has very distinct, very distinct taste, and the, but she's going to keep it anyway. So we kind of worked early on mm -hmm. that uh, you, 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 you buy what you want. Well, my son, my son says when he buys his wife for something, she can say, this is what I want, show it to him. And he can buy it and give it to her for gift. This isn't the one I was looking at. <laughs> well, because and women's clothes, I don't even want to get into women. Scoop neck, V neck, yeah. round neck, crew neck. I don't know. Oh, you know, 
<laughs> green, aqua. You know, well, I don't like orange. It looks red. Well, I don't like red either. I don't want to get into this. You know, I don't want anything around my neck. But it's the wrong thing. I, so I, it's so much easier. Just, just whatever you want. What's that? That's a cop out. Give her money. Yeah, that, that's. Well, we've been married long enough that you, we really can do that. Yeah. Early on, no, you, you know, we had there was we went through some tears. Yeah. You know, <laughs> adjusting to yes. different views of gifts. It takes the it, meaning of gifts and significant of gifts. Well, it takes we're time we're past that. Gifts or not, two, two people for the first time getting like together and yeah. <laughs> making a hole, so to speak. They're going to have problems because they're they're no matter how much you love one another, you're going to have different views and different. One you know, time, we have different personalities and <clears throat> our first Christmas, married, first married Christmas, Debbie gave me something that I swear I thought was a gag gift. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I laughed. Uh -oh. <laughs> Every Christmas she reminds me. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, but every Christmas. Yeah. She reminds me of what I did. Did you hang it on? You should hang it on a tree. Did she put it in a tree? Oh, it was, it was too big. It, too big to put oh, on a tree. <laughs> and uh, but I swear I thought it was a gag. I swear I thought it was a gag. It was something to wear. And I, I can't conceive of ever wearing it. Uh, Have you received ever used a gift it? that you returned and then changed your mind and ended up rebuying the gift? Oh. <laughs> Rebuying the gift for Debbie or for myself? For yourself. You were the recipient. You really didn't think I'd use it, so okay, take it back. So we took her back, and well, who would do that? That would—that's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> You'd have to. Oh, I'm sorry. That guy. <laughs> Not even have Christmas. Yeah, should, should, he should forfeit. Don't his, even have Christmas. Should send away his foreign wife. <laughs> oh, the fun we have. Oh, life is great. <laughs> <laughs>